thing yesterday. So you, I'm not going to explain, you are going to have a, a, an equation which looks like this, the tangent of something, 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 which V not in there, equal minus something, something, something with V not there, right? So this is an equation uh, that cannot be, uh, well, cannot be solved analytically, right? So basically we cannot take V naught out and say, okay, V naught is equal to 20 divided by three, right? I just uh, making up numbers here. So what we do is we solve it by iteration. And that implies that implies that <clears throat> we keep giving values to, to V naught, right? Um, until this term equal this term, right? So basically you give a bunch of values for V naught and see here term one and term two is here, right? Of this equation, this is term one, as I explained yesterday, and this is term two. There's a negative sign here, which, as I explained yesterday, is important to know because the tangent does like this, right? And uh, actually, like this. Sorry, the tangent is. Uh, I think the tangent does. Tangent of zero. Yep. Yeah. Right. So it goes here, and uh, and again does this thing over here right so basically this is the negative sign on this side this is positive negative positive so that gives you a hint on how uh, to start to start shooting this iteration method right so basically you will choose v naught this is 20 and then you will see that term one is 10 and term two is 40 so obviously 20 is not the case right so you will use uh, 100 and you have whatever, 20 here and 10 here, right? So again, 100 is not the case. So you keep choosing the values until you reach a number, which is, you know, term one is 30 and term two is 30. So whatever, 30.2 and 30.2. So this is the value that you need to de determine, right? So, I'm going to give you an extension, uh, but I want you to, uh, if we wrote a com, is that okay, guys? Is, is that clear? So, guess so? Is that clear now? Let's speak up, so guess so? Hmm. Guys, is that clear? Yes or no? <clears throat> In the iteration, yeah. will we need to will we need to find the error, or can we use that error to find the answer? You you just find you just find when the two terms match. Right? Yes, but sometimes, at least when I was doing it, I noticed not all of them were exactly alike. Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. You want to add an error to your calculation. But there must be a number. There must be a number 20, whatever, or 30 something, or 40 something, where you get the. Are you doing, are you doing with Python or with the Excel, Ivan? So we use the columns with T1 and T2 and sub indifferent value of P0 while comparing T1 and T2. Okay, Justin, that's the case. Vivan, it's clear or not? There's no error. There should be a number. I mean, it can be roughly, it doesn't have to be exactly the same.
All right. So uh, <clears throat> these discussions, I normally don't, uh, I cut them from the videos. I don't want anyone to say, oh, this guy asked a stupid question or this one, you know, I don't want, I don't want to be any, to have any, any bullying or anything, you know, so I want you to come to the lectures and whatever videos we have, it will be just the lecture. And uh, I don't know if you agree with that. I don't want you to, to say, okay, there's no stupid questions, as I always say, but, you know, some students will say, wow, what is this? What, what is he asking or what is she asking? So I don't want that. <clears throat> so that is, that is why we do this, these Zoom meetings. And this is why it's important that you come to the lectures, I mean, to the online lectures, to ask any questions. In the, uh, in the videos, which are going to start right now, um, I will cut the discussions if you, if you think it's, that's, that's okay. Um, Prof. Nico? Yeah? Will it be possible to give us um, the solutions to the previous assignments that we did as preparation for the upcoming test, just to see where right. we went wrong? That's, that's a, very good, a very good point, but that was, um, you see, the, 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 the problem was that, um, that you have the quantum test, and I think uh, Craig Mel was, uh, was working on those, so I will have to ask him, what is my cell phone now? I will just, I always have to be careful with my, my kids always taking the cell phone and playing. So let's see, uh, I, he answered a question. Let me see, I asked him to, to do this this morning. Uh, no, he didn't reply. So, but I will, I will try to get them done by, by tomorrow. I will ask him at least to, at least to do a memo, right? If he's, he's not marked, I will, I will send memos of the, but the memos, you know, you know how to solve the Tantalum radius, right? And, and you know, and you know, let me go quickly. Basically the, for the helium four, for the radius of the, this, the, the range of the nuclear force, those, those were the two questions, right, uh, Shoki? For the, uh, for the tantalum, it's, it's kind of easy, right? Because you just have to do the one half, and we went through that the other day. U1 square, uh, and then Z1, Z2, E square over R, right? Basically, you get R. Uh, R, as you know very well, is the distance between the, the two centers, right? We assume that this distance here was delta X equal to 1.5. And we assume that the radius of the alpha or the helium four was equal to 1.9 Fermi, which comes from, uh, comes from the, uh, from the, uh, the question that you know so well, 1.2 A to the one third, right? Fermi. Assuming always that this is a spherical, right? which is not always the case. This is, I, I want to leave it there, but the, 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 the nucleus is not always spherical. And this is one of the, of the programs that we do here at UWC to measure the actual shape. Sometimes we have a quadrupole shape looking like a lentil. Sometimes we have a quadrupole shape looking like a rugby ball. Sometimes we have a kind of a triaxial shape looking like a galaxy or something, you know? So, but anyway, we assume that and uh, we know that E square, and then I told you to use the typical 1.44 MeV Fermi, right? And uh, the typical, uh, you, you would need to, to get the, 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 the reduced mass, which also you know how to do it. So this was a, an easy problem, right? The radius of tantalum, uh, correct, uh, Shoki? I mean, you don't need, uh, do you need a, a memo for this one? at least to get your marks, right? Um, yes, sir. Just to see um, how, like if we did the, did the right procedure in preparation right. for the test. And also okay. on that note, what is it chapter one and two for the test? Or is it all chapters up to what we've done so far? 
So I would I would also uh, take the chapter for the beta decay, right? There's a in, in Crane, I think it's chapter chapter seven. And I added today, uh, let me share with you guys. I added uh, a bunch of uh, things today, uh, like uh, in lessons. So I added this book chapter, uh, which uh, obviously is right here, but uh, I have it here for you. So I, this chapter is intended to supplement chapter nine of Crane's ex excellent book, right? So I think chapter nine is on beta decay. So I would like you to read that chapter and we go through, we'll include beta decay, and a little bit of the, of the decay properties of, of nuclei, which I, I will explain between today and tomorrow. So yeah, so we go up to the, the last day. Now, very important is the, the, the question here, where, you know, I told you about the, this, probably no one got it right, or very few got it right, if any, that you know you you have a very sudden increase in the in the nuclear force, right? In the binding energy per nucleon. That means that uh, if you add one, two, three, four uh, nucleons put together, this sudden increase there, but then you start curving, and the maximum here is at uh, 62 nickel. But obviously, we cannot use 62 nickel as the maximum of the peak because the saturation already started before. So it is with this sudden, right? Sudden increase, the large gradient here, how it changed, because then once we keep adding particles, protons or neutrons, this obviously there's a saturation here, it doesn't change much. Uh, so this is what basically what you have to say, that this sudden increase happens here, to the radius of the of the alpha particle of the helium four, so basically the force adds up to the radius of that part of the of the of the alpha particle, right? So this was an approximation, but the important part here was for you to start thinking, you know, not to be afraid. This this these graphs are not there for for pretty pictures or for you know, they are there to, for us to, to go through them and understand what they actually mean. All right. So basically, this, this was the explanation for assignment number two and assignment number one. The only issue was that, you know, this is the center of mass. This is the initial velocity. But uh, the initial velocity, you need to, is not, is not coming from this term, this kinetic energy, is not the kinetic energy in the graph uh, in the graph of the of the of the tantalum, right? In this point here, this is the kinetic energy in the laboratory frame. So this is the the energy that you need to deduce whatever is this energy in the graph, and extract get from here the u1 square, right? And then get the reduced mass independently and equal this in the center of mass frame. All right, so uh, do you agree that I put this this discussion here at least in the in the lecture in the video so you can go through it? Check what you're saying here. Uh, yes, Prof. Okay, so we'll do so. A memo will be appreciated. Okay, but I'm telling you how to do it. I mean, you just have to finalize it i mean i can just it's just using the calculator and, and solve it right it's not the, there's not much of a i will send the memo but uh, there's not much more to do so now uh i'm going to uh let's open let's open here uh before i forget let's quickly go to assignments and uh what happened here previous assignments What happened here now? Here we go. So now we are going to go to this assignment, edit. Uh, I'm going to give you until tonight to keep fighting yourself, or let's say until tomorrow morning. 
I'm going to give you until tomorrow morning at 25 is today. So I'm going to give you on 26. Done. And 20. Actually, uh, actually, I, I actually left you uh, submit until, you see, until 11.45 tonight. But let's, let's make it, uh, I want you to spend time and enjoy this problem. So I'm going to give you until tomorrow at uh, 11 a.m. before our lecture. Uh, done. So 26, 26, right. And as I say, I want the both. I want your calculations, explanations, and I want the, the, uh, the Python or the, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the Excel file. All right, now let's go to our lecture, which is here. So again, this is uh, our nuclear landscape with all nuclei in there. These uh, vertical and horizontal lines, they, they, are, they are the magic numbers, which I mentioned uh, already. And uh, you will see that most of these guys decay by beta plus, but not only by beta plus, they also uh, electron conversion, the opposite uh, process that we saw yesterday. And, you know, these guys decay by beta minus, right? Always in a diagonal line reaching the uh, stable nuclei. So now, yesterday we went through this. And I told you, I told you that the, the relevance of the Q value, the relevance of the Q value was to know what you can see, you know, below the Q value, mm, below the energy release, obviously that's the energy where you are in the daughter nucleus. Here we have the parent nucleus, which is the, in this case, yttrium 82. And this, it goes to the daughter nucleus, which is uh, strontium 82. So energies below this uh, 7.8 uh, MeV can be uh, a little bit below that can be found, can be, can you have a decay, you know, where, where, where the nucleus, the daughter nucleus is going to be excited with that energy or less, generally less than that. But I wanted to uh, tell you one thing about, so there's always some selection rules on this. Um, for instance, I just, uh, here we go. This is also in the, in the, in the, in the chapter I added uh, this morning on classification of, of transitions in beta decay. Uh, you have different nomenclature. Basically, if uh, you have, this is the, the typical beta decay. This is the nucleus, initial nucleus, the final nucleus, the angular momentum of the initial nucleus, the ang angular momentum, momentum of the final, the dota, plus the orbital and spin angular momentum of the electron and the neutrino being emitted in the beta decay. So there are different conditions and then there are different uh, nomenclatures that, uh, you know, if, uh, if S equal to zero, the spin, which means that the, the, the electron and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the neutrino, they have anti-parallel spins, right? So this is called a Fermi transition. If S is equal to one, both of them pointing in the same direction, uh, we call it a, a gamma of Teller transition. And basically, this is what I want you to, to remember more. We have these super allowed transitions, uh, allowed transitions, where basically um, the difference in spin is zero or plus minus one, which uh, implies basically uh, that this one plus, will, that's the case to the, either to the one plus or plus minus one, right? To the zero plus, to the two plus, two plus or zero plus. This guy doesn't decay to a four plus. You see, has a positive parity, goes to positive parity, and plus uh, either there's an increment of no increment or increment of plus minus one, right? So this one will go to two, we go to zero, we go to two. And the same thing will happen with this fellow. You know, this is in brackets because we don't know really what it is. 
um, there will be some transitions. It may be four. It may, I think it's a four actually. So these transitions here will be um, forbidden. You know, if uh, if first thing, if there's a change in parity, then things become more forbidden, right? If there is no change in parity, super allowed. Uh, that's a Fermi or allowed uh, beta decay. First forbidden, we, which we also see, uh, it implies that uh, there is a there is a the, the, the orbital angular momentum is one, and there's a change in parity. There, there are more second forbidden, third forbidden, which are rare to see, and this is important when we design an experiment, right? When we design an experiment, we want to study these guys. So, say we want to study a zero plus state. Which is, has a very very important um, consequences in terms of uh, how nuclei change uh, shapes. So if we want to see as if we want to study a zero plus state, we cannot use this decay from here because it won't populate the zero plus state that we want to we want to see, right? So that's uh, for instance uh, just what I wanted to say regarding the. Uh, selection rules and uh, tomorrow we go through more selection rules in terms of uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, transitions so now i'm going to uh, move on a little bit and go to the some applications of beta decay so i'm going to in introduce the term of decay heat you know this is a uh, 10 years in March was 10 years uh, that uh, this uh, disaster happened in Fukushima where there was a, a, an earthquake about 100 kilometers from from this power plant and there was a, a tsunami that arrived only about 50 minutes later with a very large uh, with a large uh, or the largest wave was uh, like 14 to 15 meters this is normally here you have the sea level <clears throat> uh, let me just make this bigger I'll remove this nonsense here all right so we can see now better so this was the sea level and this was the the the, the what people believe you know the protect the protect the protective barrier was about 10 meters from from the normal sea level which but the tsunami was too big and the way was 10 to 15 which flooded the uh, the the Fukushima plant, and this uh, uh, flooding caused the failure of the emergency generators, which are used to uh, pump up the water from the ocean. That's why these these power plants they are always placed in the ocean, where there's enough mm -hmm. cooling uh, resources, like our power plant here in in, Co in Kuburg, right? It is on the Atlantic Ocean, close to the sea, close to the ocean to, to get water if needed. If something happens, you can cool things down. However, if the because of this flooding, these uh, generators, the emergency generators, were not uh, they were not working, and these circulating pumps to to bring the water from the ocean didn't work, and then uh, the decay heat from the reaction i mean from the from the in the in the in the tank in the core of the of the nuclear reactor it was too much and you have this all these explosions and not only that with those explosions the 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 contaminants came through throughout the water and the pacific ocean became really pretty much uh, radioactive for uh, for some time so basically uh, this was the situation here. This is the Tokoku earthquake, about 130 kilometers from the from the nuclear reactor, and this big wave uh, arrived quite fast. Uh, you know, 130 kilometers, 50 minutes later, about 156 kilometers per hour was this wave, this large uh, tsunami wave, uh, traveling through, and that was the the situation, right? So now, uh, this is a typical situation. You have the 
how actually electricity is producing a nuclear reactor. This is the core of the, of the, of the reactor. And you have all this uh, fission of elements. And this fission of elements, of heavy elements, plutonium or... So generally, I mean, they, they lead according to Einstein's formula, they release energy and this energy uh, heats the water. This uh, water goes to the turbine generators and start moving the turbine. And then uh, this, uh, this is a typical process in any, any uh, energy. Whenever we want to create electricity, we have always to apply, uh, is, it, is it coming or not? There we go. We always have to apply, apply uh, Faraday's law of induction. Uh, oh, here we go. There's no space here. Right. So, uh, as you know, the source, and this is what uh, this equation means the source of electricity of electric field is equal to minus the uh, change in the magnetic field as a function of time, right? So that's why these generators, you have a, a, a mechanical thing which move, you know, we heat the, we heat the, the water, this water uh, is connected somehow to this, uh, this, uh, this ring basically, which is, this, this moves the, moves the, uh, the turbine, which has a, a bunch of uh, magnets around, and it is normally made of a coil, coil, uh, I mean, uh, car, um, a couple coils, metal, which circulate with, uh, which uh, allows for the electrons to move in a metal very fast. And this change, this thing start rotating. And this rotation starts creating a change in the magnetic field. And this generate the electricity according to uh, to one of the of the Maxwell, uh, Maxwell's laws, right? This is uh, explained here, and basically you can see if we apply um, the Stokes theorem. Uh, let me see what is it. What is the course here? Ah, the course is right there. If we apply the Stokes theorem, we know that the, this one, the E, the current generated by a closed uh, circuit DL, will be equal to the uh, minus the surface uh, B with respect to T, uh, DS, this is the surface. This is from here to here, we are applying Stokes theorem, right? Uh, this, you should have seen it uh, last year, but this is how energy is generated. Energy generation and Sometimes uh, I, lo I love to, to read uh, uh, about anything, any physics related. And I would actually recommend you to, to know something, an exception to this was Barlow's uh, wheel. In Barlow's wheel, you have a, a, a wheel actually made of metal, can be coupled. And there is a, there is a, a constant field, a constant field. So basically, there's no change in the constant field. However, this wheel is uh, rotates, and there's a change in the uh, in the surface in, of the of the wheel. And this change allows also for uh, for electricity to happen. You know. So I will just uh, ask you to to go and, and read a little bit on Barlow's wheel if you want to to learn more about this but basically uh this is not even the scope of this lecture but this is what what happened this there's a heat here we make this with this heat we make this 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 thing move and here is the generator which is basically uh as i say is a coil copper wire and then you have the magnets here on the sides and that produced electricity through faraday's law and but uh, these uh, nuclear reactors, they have lots of uh, safety issues, as you know. 
first you you shut down and this is what they did in fukushima you shut down the reactor quickly and you stop stop any any fission process to happen so the systems uh, to cool the reactor down and, and carry heat away from it they are based basically in the in this ocean water we just keep uh, but this this requires a lot of studies on on how what is the best way to to cool this down how long do we need to cool it down what is the what are the temperatures involved the coolant that we need to 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 include so this is uh, an important uh, uh, research field as we're going to see in a little bit and also you must have these barriers to contain the radioactivity and prevent it from escaping uh, into the environment lots of cesium-137 was emitted from the fukushima uh, reactor into the ocean lots of radioactivity and there are thousands of papers of articles research articles uh, talking about about the effects of radioactivity in the uh, in the ocean waters life in the ocean waters so here we have how we boil the water uh, basically you boil the water you make the turbine move and that move or the, that change in the in the in the magnetic field according to faraday's law of induction creates an electric field and this is the way electricity goes to the houses everywhere so now the question is that i want to uh, heat from what happened at fukushima was not that they, they did all the all the all the uh, safety procedures however there's a, an extra source of uh, radiation and i want to i want to wonder here scuba next it was uh, some presentations at that time once once this fukushima disaster happened 10 years ago we were, we were wondering what uh, what would happen if if the same things the same situation happens in, in south africa so uh i'll go through that in a little bit but i want to uh, let you know that once you stop the fission the fission stops right let's say okay we have uranium 235 we add a neutron uranium 236 and then boom the the, the fission occurs and this, this uh, uranium 236 splits into krypton 92 and barium 141 and then you start having a series, a chain reaction, because you have uh, you have uh, also neutrons being emitted, but also beta decay, right? You have uh, this guy will 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 we'll beta decay to rubidium ninety two, to strontium eighty two, to yttrium ninety two, to zirconium ninety two, which is the stable one, right? So, and this guy will go and say, okay, this guy will go to again beta decay lanthanum 141 uh, cesium 141 or cesium 141 and uh, praseodymium 141 whatever i don't remember this name very well, exactly uh, so basically after fission we stop fission but still these guys take uh, minutes hours days seconds to decay eventually to those black squares in the shard of nucleides, right? So this is still generating heat after we have shut down the reactor. And this is where we have, we have the, the, the safety procedures in cooling down the core of the reactor and making sure that everything is contained there. In fact, uh, what is happening here now? Yeah, well, in fact, look at this. You know, during the during the reactor, while the reactor is working, this uh, the uranium two thirty five. This is the decay heat, and decay heat from the beta decay is only seven percent of the total energy release for a working reactor, right? In a working reactor, we have only seven percent. However, once the reactor is shut down, the decay becomes dominant. The beta decay. Um, becomes almost 100 percent and the related heat obviously has to be removed 
So there's a nice article here by one of our uh, good friends, Alejandro Agora, and collaborators also, Berta Rubio, she has also been here. So, and uh, basically, as I was saying before, there's a lot of studies trying to understand this uh, beta decay, uh, this heat coming from beta decay. And there's uh, many calculations, many codes, which try to calculate this as, as precise as possible. So we have a, a very uh, detailed information on this cooling period that we need to, 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 to be uh, considering when you, when you um, cool down the, the reactor. So now let's see. Let's see, actually, I wanted to uh, make the point. I think I lost some slides here, but uh, I don't know where they are. But anyway, this is what happens in, uh, in the world. These are the different tectonic plates. It's a beautiful uh, uh, drawing here, I mean, of the, of the tectonic plates. And when the, the intensity of earthquakes can be expected to be large or very high average or low, right? So in here, in most Africa, everything is low. Although here in, in South Africa, we have a very low. Here we have a, a low thing. So we, we don't expect much of earthquakes. This is our corner right there. Um, a little bit, actually, uh, a little bit of average close to Cape Town. It will just zoom, zoom in. There's a little bit of uh, some earthquakes that we, we, you know, we may, we may have, but, but uh, in recent history, this is rare. But let's assume quickly, you know, if, if like for the Fukushima um, earthquake, the tsunami travel at 156 kilometers per hour, the neck, the plate here, the, Antart uh, the Antar Antarctic plate, is about two thousand kilometers from South Africa. A little bit less here, in this, in this, in this area, about the same, maybe fifteen, fifteen hundred. But basically, uh, kilometers. So that will take about twelve point eight hours. If there's an earthquake here, and this earthquake here produces a tsunami, or those, uh, or that, or that magnitude, it will take about 13 hours to reach the waters, I mean, the, the coastline in South Africa. So in Japan, on the other hand, just you have, it takes, it took 50 minutes because the plate here is very close to the land, right? To the coastline in, in Japan. So you need very precise warning systems uh, about tsunamis, right? So tsunami warning systems are very important. In South Africa, the same, we will have uh, a little bit more time to react, but it's also important to have uh, uh, everywhere. I think it's important because earthquakes, they, they, they present a cycle. Maybe there was a, a big earthquake here in South Africa, you know, one million years ago, and no one knows about that, right? But every one million years, that earthquake, you know, the earth crust starts accumulating uh, energy and it has to be released somehow, right? So every whatever, one million or one million plus minus hundred thousand years, you know, we may have. I just, I just guessing because this information we don't know because we were not. Uh, I don't know if there's any any evidence of uh, an earthquake of large high magnitude in South Africa, but assuming that they are cycle they, that they they happen from you know regularly, but with a, with a, maybe with a long cycle. This may happen in South Africa, so still I will say, okay, let's prevent ourselves and let's keep a, a system of a tsunami warning on the coastline of South Africa. But you see, you have to go far away here to, to deduce, to, the, to detect the, the earthquake and the, the, the following tsunami, if there's a tsunami. Sometimes, most of the times, there's no, there's no tsunami after that, right? But these are the considerations that we, we, we deduce, you know, from the, and we need those containers in Fukushima. Everything is to build bigger containers. So if this situation happens again, we don't have this, this radioactive material going to the ocean, right? 
So how do we study these things? So well, we study these things is decay heat by using total absorption spectroscopy. This is an experiment that uh, we were actually running at CERN in a few years back, 2000, 2016 or 2017. We ran this experiment at CERN, and this is Alejandro Algora, where the radiation is brought in with a tape, which has a cycle also. So say you have a nucleus you want to study, and this nucleus decays with a beta decay by, you know, in, in five seconds, right? Or let's say in, in, in one second. And the other nuclei, which also come because they, they all, you have all these isobars. So the purer, the, the, the incoming beam, the better, because you don't have to worry about these isobars, but it's very rare that whatever you want to study doesn't come with another isobar. So if that isobar has like 10 seconds, so you just make a cycle and, 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 and get, the, get the, the, the implant, that beam, and make maybe a two second cycle, and then you get rid of the, uh, or the other uh, nuclei that you don't, want to, you don't want to study. So these tape stations are very interesting to, uh, to play with the different decay, half-life of the beta decay for a particular nucleus, and trying to always get rid of the other guy who you are not, which you are not interested in. So there's also a nice video here by uh if you go to to our our youtube channel um it's called the, the the pandemonium the capital of hell you know this is this is actually a very nice video which explains many of the things that uh, i have uh, explained today it goes into more detail into into nuclear reactors because the nuclear reactors are an important source of uh, neutrinos and neutrinos is a uh, Neutrino physics is a very hot topic nowadays, trying to investigate uh, the, the, the possibility of what is the mass of the neutrino, you know, the, the neutrino oscillations. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, interest regarding neutrinos in, and, and nuclear reactors in particular is a, is a big source of neutrinos. So we, we, we study those as well, but we use this, basically this the device here, which also allows, I just uh, to mention again, also allows to uh, determine the shapes of nuclei by comparing with some uh, theoretical calculations. I just don't want you to, to go through this in too much detail, but basically I want to tell you that, you know, this is the experimental data of a gamma of stellar distribution. It's one of these um, allowed uh, beta decays with a spin, uh, uh, spins up, right? For the electron and for the neutrino, S equal to one. And once you study this decay, this uh, gamma of stellar uh, the strength distribution, you can compare with some theoretical calculations for a particular nucleus. Here is a nucleus with a, either you have a, an oplate, a, a lentil kind of shape, or you have a prolate, like a rugby kind of shape, right? So these are the things that we, we investigate, and you can see here the, the calculations, which agrees nicely with having a rugby uh, rugby ball, which is a prolate shape. Oblate will be kind of a, a lentil a lentil kind of shape. Okay, so these are the things I wanted to tell you today about the K heat. And I remember I have other slides here, but uh, I think they disappear somehow. We went through through a nuclear reactor. We explain how electricity is generated and the safety um, procedures that uh, we, we need to know. The reactors have to be close to the ocean, but also we need to contain any radioactive material from going to the ocean or to, to, to inland, right? Through any, any explosion. So these are, this is what happened in Fukushima. We explore what will happen if, uh, if we have a, an earthquake in the Antar Antarctic plate, which is about 2000 kilometers away from us, we told you that, uh, that the, the decay heat at the beginning, once you shut down the reactor, still there's a lot of uh, energy being released through the, through the beta decay process. 
lots of uh, antineutrinos and electrons and and the q value remember the q value of that of those of those reactions which is the the emc square of albert einstein and basically uh i told you methods that we do to study that decay heat from nuclear reactors and how we uh, we try to be as accurate as possible in in order to uh understand that you need a cooling period you know 3000 seconds with these particular uh, conditions you know everything has to be very precisely determined to stop the the reactor from uh, being a danger to humanity 